Good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? Amen. You ready to worship Jesus tonight? Come on, it's our last night. Are you with me? Amen.
Lift up a loud shout of praise in this place tonight.
receive your glory, your glory in this room, sweeping in this room, sweeping over each of us. Let your glory move in this place. We receive it. We glorify you. We thank you for all that you're doing in this place. We receive your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you for being here this evening. It's going to be a wonderful night. Greet somebody around you before you're seated. God bless you, everybody. Well, welcome back, everyone. Good to see you on a Wednesday night, our, our final evening of this prayer and fasting. It's great to see you. We've, our focus has been, if you haven't been to any, maybe this is your first one, the last one on a Wednesday night. Our focus is the glory of the Lord. Show us your glory. And we've talked about two places in the New Testament, and, and tonight we're going to talk about the second place in the Old Testament. So we've done two from the Old Testament, two from the New Tonight is the glory of the Lord's house. We want to look at some different places in the Old Testament, both with the tabernacle in the desert and also with the temple where we see the glory of the Lord's house. So turn, if you will, to Exodus chapter 40. We're going to do some different praying, some different things. We're going to receive communion tonight. Uh, I'm going to ask you to wait, and in a couple of these, in a couple of teachings, one of the prayer sessions, we're going to receive communion together. We're going to do some different things. Exodus chapter 40 and verse 33. Now, I want to remind you of where we are. The children of Israel have come out of slavery in Egypt. They're in the desert. And God has given Moses clear instructions on how to build this movable uh, place to worship, what we know as the tabernacle. This is not the temple. The temple, I was actually talking to somebody about this tonight. The temple can only be built in Jerusalem. And, and Solomon's going to do that, and we're going to deal with that in just a minute. But this is the movable tabernacle that allowed the children of Israel to do sacrifices and, and, to, and to seek God in the desert experience. So God has given Moses clear instructions on exactly how to build the tabernacle. That's what he's doing. So this is where we pick up Exodus chapter 40 and verse 33. Moses raised up the court all around the tabernacle and the altar and hung up the screen of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. All right? So let's stop right there. The, the tabernacle is done. It's finished. Now, verse 34, excuse me, verse 34, look what happens. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. We're going to see this over and over again with both the temple and the tabernacle, that when it's completed, when the work is done, the glory of the Lord enters. 
So look what happens in verse 35. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day and fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So the first thing that we see with the glory of the Lord in this, in this house, the tabernacle, is that the glory of the Lord gives us guidance. This is so simple, and we're going to keep this prayer time simple tonight. This is such a simple concept. If the cloud is above the tabernacle and it doesn't move, then the children of Israel don't move. And if the cloud goes upward from the tabernacle and begins to move, then the children of Israel realize it's time to follow God. Wouldn't it be wonderful if that's how God continued to work? <laughs> Wouldn't that be so nice if you just got a little pillar of fire and you just and you went, oh, this is my new job. Oh, this is my spouse. Oh, this is where I'm so. Oh, this is. Wouldn't it, it's so wonderful. We don't get that, but we still have very obvious signs, and God speaks to us, and He guides us, and He directs us. The problem is twofold for us. We either decide that we want to move on before God calls us. Before God directs us, we take it in our own and we decide this is where I'm going, this is where he's directing me, this is where he's guiding me, so we get ahead of God. Most times when you hear about people not not hearing from God or disobeying, it's always about getting ahead of God. But I want to challenge you. The problem is twofold. The other issue is the cloud moves and you say, you know what, I'm staying right here. I'm not going. The cloud is calling me into this new thing, this new place. It's guiding and directing me onward towards something else, and I refuse to leave. I'm staying here. So our problem in guidance is twofold. We either move before God wants us to move or go in a direction that God's not calling us to go, or when we clearly know that God is calling us on, we refuse to go. We stay where we are. So as we, as we do this prayer, because I, I want to move quickly through some of these because we have some longer prayers and some different things that I want to do. As we pray this prayer, I want you to pray for guidance, but I also want you to pray for obedience. This prayer is twofold. I've said this many times. So many of us say, God, I want a word for my life. I need a word for my life. More times than not, we know the word. What we need is the obedience to do what he tells us. So I want this to be a twofold prayer for your life. What is God saying to you? Where is God guiding you? Where is God directing you? And then you're going to pray for the obedience to obey that call. As that guidance comes, how can I move forward? The glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle. And when the glory of the Lord moves, the people move. And when it stays, the people stay. We want that same level of obedience. We, we want that. So let's pray for this. Let's pray for guidance and obedience. Hear his guidance. Obey his instructions. Let's pray.
God, we want the glory of your guidance. We want your glory to guide us and direct us, making it clear where we should go, what we should be about, the destiny, the purpose that is on our life. God, help us not to ever, ever, ever run in front of you. But Lord, help us to never, ever refuse to move when you are calling us to a new season. God, help us, as the children of Israel did, to follow your glory. We want the glory of your house. We want the glory of your guidance. Help us to follow you and stay in the center of your will in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, the children of Israel worship in the tabernacle. Then they cross over into the Jordan River. They have the Ark of the Covenant. You know this. And they set up the tabernacle there in Israel. But it's not the permanent home. Because remember, that is, that's the Lord's house. It's God's home. So David wants to build a temple. And, and God says, no, you're not going to do it. But your son Solomon is going to do it. So David raises the money and leaves the blueprints and all of these things. And he turns over the building of the temple, what we know as Solomon's temple, to his son Solomon. So turn, if you will, to two chronicles. Remaining... In the Old Testament. 2 Chronicles chapter 5. Two Chronicles 5 and 1. So all the work that Solomon had done for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in the things which his father David had dedicated, the silver and the gold and the furnishings. And he put them in the treasuries of the house of God. Skip down to verse 13. They go to to consecrate the temple now. 5 and 13. Indeed it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound, to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. That the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Solomon builds the temple. The temple is finished. And when they go to consecrate the temple, the glory of the Lord descends. But when does it descend? After the people worship. Look again at verse 13. And they sang as one to make one sound. Do you see that one sound? They were in unity. They were in harmony. It is not to say that they could all sing. It is to say that they were all not only singing the same thing, but they were in unison in what they wanted. And what they wanted was the glory of the Lord to fill the Lord's house. The glory of the Lord gives us guidance, but the glory of the Lord is found in our worship. Worship is, is, that is, the glory of the Lord demands our worship. And it's a worship that fills us with unity. We are, co- we are committed to the same thing. We want to see the same thing. I, imagine this. The priests cannot continue doing sacrifices because the glory of the Lord is so thick that they can no longer see the animals. They can no longer see the people. What do they sing? For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. He is good and his mercy endures forever. Now, I know we sang a couple of songs to start, but we're going to sing another one now. So I'm going to ask the musicians and the singers if they will get ready. We're going to pray, but we're also going to praise. We are going to worship with one voice in this moment. And I I asked them to sing, um, is it... We are worthy, right? What's it called? Worthy of it all. Worthy of it all. We sang it last night. I really liked it. And, and worthy of it all. So I, I'm gonna, I, I, they're going to sing. If you want to come to the front and worship, if you want to stand and worship, sit, whatever you want to do. But we talk a lot frequently about how we want the glory of the Lord to descend. But often we're unwilling to do what's necessary to enter into worship. So let's worship one voice, one song in unity. We are worshiping. We fill this house. This is the house of the Lord. This is the house of the Lord. The the, the tabernacle, the temple does not have a stranglehold on the house of the Lord. This is the house of the Lord. And I want to see the glory of the Lord fill this house. And it is filled through his worship. So let's just worship. Whatever you want to do, however you want to do it in this moment, but let's worship. 
and as one to make one sound, they were heard in praising and thanking the Lord, saying, He is good, and His mercy endures forever. Let's worship Him. Lord, we receive it. You inhabit the praises of your people. God, let your glory just 
rain down on us. Let your glory fill this place, filling each of us. We glorify you. We worship you. We glorify your glory. We glorify you with our worship, with our praise. Let everything that we do, let everything that proceeds out of our mouth be pleasing to you. God, we worship you in this moment. Let your glory fall on each of us and fall in this place. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen and amen and amen and amen. Thank you, guys. They're going to come back again at the end. You can be seated. This is interesting. They've got, there's several chapters here in 2 Chronicles where it talks about everything that's happening with the finishing, the completion, the dedication of the temple. But in this moment, when they, when they lift their voices and worship and praise, boom, the glory of the Lord descends and it's magnificent and wonderful and it fills the temple. Now, Solomon has a long prayer of dedication. There's all this that happens. Turn over two chapters to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Now, they had all the sacrifices out, all the offerings out, and Solomon prays this prayer. Now, look at 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 1. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. So it happens again. Do you see that? It happens again. Look at verse 3. When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endures forever. The same thing that they sang two chapters earlier. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. The Lord inhabits the praise of His people. The worship happens in that moment. The people singing as one in unity and the glory of the Lord comes down. Now it happens a second time. And what does it happen? It happens immediately following a moment of sacrifice. The glory of the Lord is, is found in our sacrifice. We, 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 it, 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 the, the fire comes down, it consumes the sacrifice, consumes the burnt offerings, and the glory fills the temple again. Sacrifice is a vital component to finding and experiencing the glory of the Lord. Everybody says, oh, I want to see fire from heaven, right? It happens right here. It happened previously with Elijah. You remember this with the, the, the contest on the Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal and the fire comes down and consumes his offering and his sacrifice. We say, gosh, I wish I could see fire from heaven. But I want to challenge you. The only time that you're going to see fire from heaven is when there's something for the fire to consume, if you never give God a sacrifice, you're not ever going to see fire from heaven. If you refuse to give Him that stuff that you've been holding on to, if you refuse to sacrifice to Him your future, your destiny, your whatever it is, the stuff you've been holding on to, fire can only come down and consume something that's been given to Him. He had a sacrifice on Mount Carmel. Solomon had the sacrifice here and the fire comes down. It doesn't consume Solomon. It consumes his sacrifice. You want the glory of the Lord to fill the Lord's house, then all of us collectively have to be willing to sacrifice something to God. And in that sacrifice, we experience the glory of the Lord. It comes through worship, and it comes through sacrifice. These are the two places in the dedication of Solomon's temple. David, Solomon's father, he even said, Remember, there's this moment where this man offers to give David some land. And David says, I will not offer sacrifices that cost me nothing. That is such an important concept. In so many places, in so many churches in America, the whole culture has been built around a, a, a faith that costs nothing. The whole thing has been built around a faith that costs nothing, a culture that costs nothing. There is something about belief. There's something about being a Christ follower that costs us something. If it never costs us something, you're never going to see the glory of the Lord's house descend. You have to be willing to give something up. You have to be willing to sacrifice. You have to be willing to give it away. You have to be willing to lose 
What does it gain? I lose everything in order to gain what's important. That's, that's the whole deal. If we are not willing to sacrifice and give away what we can't hold on to in order to gain what we could never get otherwise, that's, that's the walk. That's, the, that's Christianity. That's being a believer. Sacrifice is costly. But in the sacrifice, that is where the glory of the Lord shows up. So here's what we're going to do for this one. Again, a little different. I'm going to ask Tyler and Donnie if they'll prepare the elements on the side. We have communion set up for you. So in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to go forward and get your communion elements. Take them back to your chair. When everybody has gotten theirs, I'm going to come up and I want to receive communion together. But before we do that, as you're holding on to the elements, I want you to think about this. What is it? That, uh, that is his body broken. His blood shed. His what? His sacrifice for you. He says, do this to remember me. We remember his sacrifice, and in his sacrifice, we remember his victory. Are we now willing to forfeit his victory because we refuse to sacrifice something ourselves? He sacrificed it all for us. His blood shed, his body broken. The victory is there. The victory is ours. The victory can be claimed, but it can only be claimed by sacrifice. We now have to sacrifice things back to him in order to claim his victory that he's already won for us. That's the concept of communion. His body broken, his blood shed. As he has sacrificed, so now we sacrifice so that we can share his victory that he has already won. As you receive the elements and hold on to them, think about that thing that God is speaking to you about. Is there something in your life that you've refused to sacrifice to him? Hold the elements, pray about that, and I'm going to come up when everybody's been served and we'll receive together. Let's receive the elements. Of the Lord 
fills the house of the Lord when his people are willing to sacrifice. We remember his sacrifice. And through that sacrifice, he won victory. Not just for himself, but victory for us. His victory can only be claimed by our sacrifice. We want to see the glory of the Lord. It requires sacrifice. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, when he had taken the bread, he broke it and he blessed it. And he gave it to them and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Likewise, after dinner, when he had taken the cup, he gave it to each of them and he said, this is my blood shed for you for forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. Now Solomon's temple is wonderful and it's finished and it's in place and it survives for more than 400 years. The Jewish people are able to make sacrifices there and seek God and all of those wonderful things. Then about 400 years later, the Babylonians have continued to invade and they invade Jerusalem for one final time and they tear the walls down and they burn Jerusalem and they destroy Solomon's temple. And it's over and it's finished. And they're taken into captivity in Babylon and they remain there for 70 long years until they're finally allowed to return home to Jerusalem. Turn, if you will, to Ezra chapter 3 and verse 10. Ezra 3 and 10. The captives have returned from Babylon after 70 years, and they begin to rebuild the temple. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites and the sons of Asaph with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. By the way, do you notice? It's the same song. He is good, for his mercy endures forever toward Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and the heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. See, the old guys... The guys have been around for a long time. They remember. They were in captivity in Babylon for a long time, but they remember what Solomon's temple looked like. And they look at the foundation being laid, and they say, it's never going to be the same. They say, this isn't the way it used to be. It's not going to be as wonderful. It's not going to be as glorious. It's not going to be as magnificent. It's never, ever, ever going to be the same. We remember what it used to be, and it's never going to be the same. I am leaving Restoration Church. In just a few weeks, I will preach my final message here. And above all things, I don't want a single person here to ever, ever, ever say, well, it was better when Travis was here. Well, that's not the way Travis would have done it. It was, it was way better, bigger, this, that. It's not about how it used to be. It is about how God is calling us forward, calling you forward, calling this place forward. And I want you to see the prophecy from Haggai that was given at the same time. Turn over, if you will, to the minor prophet of Haggai. And I want you to be encouraged by this. Look at Haggai chapter 2 and verse 3. This prophecy is given at the same time that the foundation of the second temple is laid. Haggai 2 and 3. The Lord is speaking through Haggai, and he says, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet be strong, Zerubbabel, 
says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Verse 9, same chapter. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give peace. The glory of the latter temple shall be greater than the former. The latter glory is greater. The latter glory is more magnificent. The latter glory is more wonderful. And in this place I will give peace. This is what I want for Restoration Church. That is what I'm desperate for. As God has called me, as the glory of the Lord, as clearly as I can see it, has moved forward for me. I want the glory of the latter temple to be greater than the former. I want to be a distant, fond memory. And everything is better and greater and more wonderful. And Haggai prophesies it over it. He says, how many of you saw the temple in its former glory? And yet the latter glory will be even better even greater, even more wonderful. Now here's what we're going to do in this prayer time. We're going to give three different prayers very quickly. Not long, very quickly. Here's the first one. I'm going to ask you to pray for whoever it is that your next pastor is going to be. We have not prayed for him corporately. He is there. God is calling him as God is directing us. He's there. And God is going to bring the right person to this place for the right time. Amen. And we're going to pray for him. We're going to pray for him, his family, all that goes into this. We're going to set our minds and our spirits and we're going to pray for him. Then I'm going to come back up and give you two more prayers in this same thing. But listen, I love you guys. And I know that you love me. But what we want is the latter glory to be greater than the former glory. This has never been about me. Not for a second. This is His church. It's always been His church. And I want to see the glory of His house spill out of here and engulf our community. And revival starts in this place because the latter glory is greater than the former glory. So right now, let's pray for our next pastor. Let's pray for who is coming to Restoration Church. I want you to intercede for him and his family right now. I don't know who it is. Nobody does. Not yet. But that person is out there. Pray for him right now. Pray for him as you have prayed for me. Let's pray. guiding him and directing him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's how we're going to pray next in this as the latter glory is greater than the former glory. I'm going to ask all of the staff of Restoration Church, paid or unpaid, if you lead a ministry and you're in the building right now, I'm going to ask you to come up. Pastor Donnie, Tyler, everybody else. I think I saw Amanda in here with women's ministry. If you're in leadership here at the church, I'm going to ask you just to come and stand on the floor here at the front. Come on. Everybody. Luke, Tim, everybody. 
stand here at the front. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Here's what you're going to do. Again, I'm not going to ask anybody to say a corporate prayer. I want you, if you feel led, if you want to come up and put your hands on them and pray over them, you can. If you want to pray from your seat, if you want to stretch your arms out. I... I love these people. I've done ministry with these people. Some of them have been here since the beginning, like Luke, Janet... Some of them are more recent, but I could not have asked for a better group of people to do ministry with. I've been blessed beyond measure, and you are blessed beyond measure. Now, they're going to go through a transition in senior leadership, and they need your prayer. They need you to intercede for them. So I want you, if you want to come up to the front and lay hands on them, whatever you want to do. But we're going to take a second, and you, are, you as Restoration Church, are going to pray for the leadership of Restoration Church. Pray for them. This is a tumultuous time for them as well as tra- in transition. So right now, stretch your hands out. Come up to the front if you want. And let's pray for the leadership of Restoration Church. we thank you for these men and women of God who lead ministries here at Restoration Church. We ask right now, we intercede for them that you would bless them in this time, that you would be with them, that the latter glory would be greater than the former glory for each of them, for their ministries, for their calling. God is not done with them. He is calling them to even more glory in the future. Guide them, direct them. Let the glory of the Lord fill each of them as it fills this place, fill each of them. God, bless the, bless the staff at Restoration Church in all things, in everything. Bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, everybody. Some of them are already up here, so don't leave yet. Council members for Restoration Church. I saw two up here. I know our other two are in here. If they'll make their way forward. We are, we were, we were six, we are five. Our friend, Mr. Sparks, passed away last week. These four men have a tremendous responsibility. In the midst of this transition, we have lost our friend, our founder, and our anchor. These men need your prayers. These guys are gonna are going to find God is going to guide them. The glory of the Lord is gonna fill these guys. And God is gonna find the pastor for this church. But they're gonna be the council. They're gonna be about what they, they're, they're gonna be about God's business, but you've got to pray for them. You've got to intercede for them. Kevin Burrell, Corey Finn, Lee Neesmith, Steve Shaw. You may or may not have known them. I told them. Nobody knows who the council is until the pastor leaves. Nobody knows who's even on the council. Nobody cares. And then all of a sudden, it's the most important job you'll ever have. And I've left them with it. And I'm sorry because I love them. But I've left them with it. And they're finding God's guidance for this church. Here's what I know. Because of these men, 
and because of all of you, the latter glory will be greater than the former glory. So here's what we're going to do again. You can come up to the front. You can stretch your hands out, but we're going to spend a couple of minutes and we're going to pray for the council of Restoration Church that God will guide and direct them and that the glory of the Lord will fill them and the glory of the Lord will bring us the exact right person. The latter glory, greater than the former glory. Let's pray for our church council right now. Join me in praying for them. Bless them, guide them, direct them. Let your, the glory of your guidance go before them. Just as clear as the cloud by day and the fire by night was, God, help it make it just that clear to them on where this church is headed and who it is that you have for this church, your next steward of Restoration Church. God, guide them, direct them, be with them, give them peace, give them encouragement, help them not to feel alone and abandoned, help them not to get discouraged in the process. Be with them in everything that they do. Bless them. Bless this your church. We are your people. This is your house. Now fill it, God. Fill it with your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. All right. Now I'm over by a few minutes, but the good news is we're all in here together and Josiah can handle the kids for a few more minutes. Or at least we hope. I don't know with that kid sometimes. So. Now here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. Haggai makes this prophecy. The glory of the, of the latter glory will be greater than the former glory. But before they went into captivity in Babylon, Ezekiel gives us this. Turn, if you will, to Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 18. Ezekiel 10 and 18. Ezekiel is seeing a vision. And it may not have even been a vision. It may have been a real thing. I believe it is not a vision that he actually saw this. Then the glory of the Lord from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. So he sees the glory of the Lord because the people are wicked and they're in idolatry and the glory of the Lord goes up and departs from the temple and leaves. This prophecy, this is a prophetic utterance. He is seeing a vision yet to come. So he has watched the glory leave. Now look at Ezekiel 43 and verse 1. Afterward, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east, the eastern gate of Jerusalem, okay? And behold, the glory of the Lord of Israel came from the way of the east. Verse 4, and the glory of the Lord came into the temple by way of the gate which faces toward the east. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. That was a prophetic vision that Ezekiel had. Uh, Haggai says the latter glory will be greater than the former glory. But here's the problem. There was no glory in the second temple. Remember, sometime during the captivity, before it, the Ark of the Covenant is lost. The Ark of the Covenant never inhabits the second temple. And no one, there is no biblical implication, there is no biblical text that tells us that they had this moment where the glory of the Lord filled the temple. They didn't have this thing where they dedicated it. 
like Solomon did, and the glory of the Lord filled it, and they sacrifice, and the glory of the Lord fills it again. There's no moment, there's no mention. And yet in both Haggai and Ezekiel, the glory of the Lord is supposed to be greater and fill the temple. And the latter glory is greater than the former glory. But it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years pass. The temple is there. Sacrifices are being made. But there is no glory. There is no glory. So was Ezekiel wrong? Was Haggai wrong? Look at Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. No, I'm sorry, verse 21. It's not going to be right on the screen. I apologize, guys, in the booth. Matthew chapter 21. Jesus is entering Jerusalem. The disciples went, to verse 6, the disciples went, Matthew 21 and 6, so the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set Jesus on them. And a great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitude who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We know from the beginning of verse 21 that Jesus is on the Mount of Olives. He comes straight down the Mount of Olives. And the only place you can enter Jerusalem is through the eastern gate. He enters Jerusalem through the eastern gate. And when Jesus had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Then Jesus went into the temple of God. And in that moment, the prophecy is fulfilled because the glory of God enters the temple of God. And in that moment, the latter glory is greater than the former glory because the latter glory is Jesus himself. Jesus is our glory. It's not going to be greater at Restoration Church because of who you hire. It's going to be greater because Jesus is here. Jesus is in the center of us. Jesus is with us. Jesus will never leave us or forsake us. He will never abandon us. Jesus is our glory. And the prophecy from Ezekiel and the prophecy from Haggai is fulfilled in that moment. Jesus enters the eastern gate. He goes straight to the temple. And the glory of the Lord fills the Lord's house. See, everything we've been talking about has been building to this moment. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father. And Moses says, show me your glory. And God says, I will have all my goodness pass before you. Because God is so good, He sent His Son in earthly shell and then on the mount of transfiguration the shell is pulled back and they see his glory in that moment all of these nights have come together have built together because it's all about jesus jesus at the center of it all restoration church is going to be okay because jesus is here you're going to be okay because jesus is here This place is going to be filled with the glory of the Lord, not because of us, but because Jesus is here. The glory of the Lord fills the Lord's house because Jesus is our glory. I've asked the musicians to return and sing. This is how we're going to close. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. That is how the glory is going to be manifested in this place. We keep Jesus at the center of everything that we do. And if we do that, the latter glory will exceed the former glory. Jesus at the center of it all.
Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be. It's always been you, Jesus. Oh
Jesus, we thank you. God, we thank you for your glory, which is your son, Jesus. Help him, help us to keep him at the center of all that we do in our personal lives and in this place. This is your house. Fill it with your glory. Help us to keep Jesus at the center of everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. The glorious son of God. Amen and amen. God bless you, everybody. Thank you for being here. Have a great evening.